Welcome to the world of material science. My name is Professor Bonnet. In this video, we will continue to talk about lattice defects and learn about how seriously they can impact material properties. Two different types of dislocations can occur as one-dimensional lattice defects, edge dislocations and screw dislocations. You can imagine the edge dislocation as an inserted crystal plane while a screw dislocation merely resembles one rotation in a spiral staircase. Frequently, dislocations do not appear as pure edge or screw dislocations, but as a combination of both types. The length of the dislocation lines per unit volume, which is the dislocation density, can be considerably increased through plastic deformation. Whereas the dislocation density of an undeformed metal lattice is about 1 km per cubic millimeter, it can be increased up to 10,000 km per cubic millimeter through cold working. Figure A depicts a cross section through a perfect metal lattice. Atoms can be slightly displaced from the equilibrium position when an external force F is applied. If the external force would be retracted, the material would behave completely elastically. This means that the crystal lattice would revert to its initial state. If the force is increased above a material-specific value, the most densely packed sliding planes slide over each other due to dislocation motion. Figure C to F. After the force is retracted, the material will partly remain elastic, but it will also show a substantial portion of plastic deformation, which means permanent deformation. Due to the plastic deformation caused by dislocation motion, the force required for the displacement of lattice planes is relatively low. This phenomenon of deformation through dislocation motion can easily be explained with the example of moving a large carpet on the floor. It is clear to everyone that it takes significantly less effort to first form a fold in the carpet and then pull the fold out rather than sliding the entire carpet across the floor. The low expenditure of force required for plastic deformation using dislocation motion is a reason for the good plastic deformation of metallic materials. The dislocations that are caused during cold working and the resulting increasing dislocation density lead to a hardening of the material. This is due to the fact that the dislocations increasingly hinder each other's movement. The mutual interference of the dislocation requires a continuous increase in stress. The resistance to the plastic deformation process increases and the metal is hardened. This figure shows that during the increase in the degree of rolling, the yield strengths RP 0.2 and the tensile strengths RM increase, while the elongation simultaneously decreases, here A 5.65. This means that the material is hardening while at the same time becoming brittle. Since the elastic deformability is primarily influenced by the bonding force of a respective metallic bond and less by the dislocation density, the modulus of elasticity, E, also does not significantly depend on the degree of deformability. All these material properties, RP 0.2, RM, A, 5.65 and E are determined in a tensile test. We will be talking about the most important fundamentals of the tensile test in the next video. Materials that have been hardened by cold working can be softened again through aging at higher temperatures, causing a decrease in dislocation density. This figure shows how the hardness of a material with a degree of rolling of 50% decreases after higher temperatures. 
while its ductility increases. We will take a closer look at the process of recrystallization later on in the chapter on heat treatment of steels. If an atom is integrated in a perfect crystal lattice, it is in a position of equilibrium. Every zero-dimensional lattice defect causes a deviation from the position of equilibrium. But even if an atom is not being exposed to the same force from all sides, as is the case in the surroundings of dislocations or on the surface of a crystal, the atoms are no longer in a position of equilibrium and have a higher energy content. In this second case, we talk about surface energy. Since the force of dislocations also mutually interfere with each other, this can lead to a chain of edge dislocations, which result in a two-dimensional lattice defect. In such cases, we talk about low angle grain boundaries, since lattice planes result that are only tiled less than 50 degrees relative to each other. The greater the distance of the dislocations, the smaller the tiled angle and the lower the energy content will be. During the crystallization of a metallic melt, naturally a large number of crystals are also formed at the same time. These crystals have independent lattice orientations in three-dimensional space. When the growth fronts of these crystals collide, the angles between the crystals will usually be greater than 50 degrees. The resulting surface lattice defect is therefore called a high angle grain boundary. The high energy content of the high angle grain boundaries lead to higher strength values for materials with fine grain structure. In contrast to work hardening, which induces dislocations by means of plastic deformation, the ductility of the material will usually be increased rather than decreased. In addition to the two prominent two-dimensional lattice defects, the low and high angle grain boundary, there are a number of special cases, especially worth mentioning in this connection, are the twin boundaries, which are created in the crystals that they divide, are symmetrically arranged as a mirror image. Twin boundaries possesses a very low energy content and mostly occur within a grain. Twin boundaries are typical for austenitic stainless steel, which we will be encountering frequently. Volume defects, which are also called inclusions, are created through gaseous, liquid or solid impurity phases and occur within the crystal. We distinguish between voids or pores, inclusions and precipitates. Voids are simply hollow spheres within a crystal which are filled with gas or liquid whereas solid impurities are referred to as inclusions. Precipitates are special cases of inclusions in which the impurity is created by the crystal itself. We will talk about this further when we have a look at non-ferrous metals in connection with the precipitation hardening of aluminum. So-called slip planes are particularly useful for dislocation motion. Slip planes are characterized by two properties. These are first, lattice planes with the highest possible atomic density, which means with a small interatomic distance. Second, lattice planes at the greatest possible distance from the next parallel plane. These conditions result in the lowest possible shear stress necessary for dislocation motion. This figure illustrates why the required shear stress for sliding planes continuously decreases with increasing atomic density. Not only the slip plane as such is determined by the atomic density, but also the possible direction of slip. Slip directions are characterized by a dense arrangement of atoms. Slip planes that are combined with slip directions are referred to as slip systems. Slip systems are responsible for the plastic deformation behavior of the different lattice types. The essential factors for good plastic properties are the number of slip systems 
and the occupancy density of the slip systems. There are significant differences in this respect between the three main lattice structures of metals FCC, BCC and HCP. In this figure, one respective slip plane with its possible slip directions is depicted for the FCC, BCC and HCP lattices. The FCC lattice has four such slip planes, each with three slip directions. This results in 12 independent slip systems. The BCC lattice has six slip planes, each with two slip directions, which also results in 12 slip systems. As already mentioned, not only the number of slip systems is essential for good plastic behavior, but also the occupancy density is a decisive factor. Even though FCC and BCC lattices have the same number of slip systems, they differ considerably in terms of the occupancy density of their slip planes. The occupancy density is the highest possible in the FCC lattice, which makes metals with FCC lattices significantly superior to those with BCC lattices in terms of plastic deformity. The difference between FCC metals and BCC metals becomes even more obvious under temperature-dependent impact stress which you will learn about in the next video. The resistance to slip increases strongly with decreasing temperature, especially in metals that don't have close-packed slip planes. After evaluating the test carried out with varied test temperatures, we can obtain clear indications of a possible transition temperature. Here, the fracture behavior in a very narrow temperature range changes from ductile to a brittle failure me mechanism. In HCP metal lattices, there are only three independent slip systems, which means that their plastic deformity is inferior to that of metals with cubic lattices. The substantially higher plastic deformability of FCC metals compared to HCP metals can be explained by the higher number of slip systems. The substantially higher plastic deformability of FCC metals compared to BCC metals can be explained by the higher occupancy density of the slip systems. So we can summarize that the plastic deformability of FCC metals is higher than that of BCC metals and much better than that of metals with hexagonal closed packed lattices. Thanks for watching this video. If you're new here, consider hitting the subscribe button. There will be regularly new videos on material science you might be interested in.